Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, hello to all of you that might be watching us uh, on YouTube live. It's great to have you with us. And also to those who will be watching later via the recording. Uh, my name is Sam Holliday. I'm going to be the host of this morning's session. Uh, and if you are watching it live and you've still got time during the next couple of days, uh, this is all part of the Business Insights Festival, which is a two day online festival um, a, a based in Gloucestershire, but covering lots of different areas as well, looking at all aspects of business. So some wonderful sessions coming up on, on everything from mental health to manufacturing, all, all the different things that have affected businesses over the last 12 months and will affect them going forward. Um, this session um, is about a subject that I guess in many ways has been discussed time and time again, but it probably never felt quite so pertinent about what is the future of the high street. And actually, I mentioned to a family member I was doing this uh, a couple of days ago, uh, a younger person, whether that's relevant or not. I said, well, I'm doing a thing called what's the future of the high street? And he said, what future? And he laughed, but do you know what? We've got to do our best to counter that. So that's one of the things we're going to be doing during the course of the morning. So before we do so, I'd just like to introduce you to a, a great panel. They're all people I've had dealings with in the past, and I know they've got plenty to say, and um, they do an awful lot to help their local communities. So um, I'll start, because we're all looking at it in different ways, from Claire. Claire, in my top uh, left-hand corner, would you like to introduce yourself? Introduction, Sam. Um, I'm Claire Thayers. I wear many different hats. Um, I'm on the board of Chapman Chamber of Commerce, um, working behind the scenes to try and support uh, Steve with the excellent work that he's doing on Visit Gloucestershire. Um, but a lot of people in Gloucestershire will also know me through the work and setting up of the Association of Gloucestershire Business Groups. And that was set up for exactly this issue, basically. A lot of our towns across the county were struggling and didn't know how to promote themselves. Um, so I learned a lot from that. And I was also chair of Winchton Business Forum, which worked very closely with the town. So that's relevant and pertinent to this discussion now. But my day job, I, I work for a company called Happily, which is about truth and transparency in the food chain. Perfect. Thank you, Claire. Good to have you with us. And uh, Lindsay, over to you. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Sam. Um, so I own and operate Cleefield Hotel just outside of Cheltenham and I am also a member of TERF. Um, TERF is a community-based group in Cheltenham. We have just over 45 members and our key factor is that we are all independent owner-operated hospitality establishments. So whether it's a coffee shop or a nightclub, we're all, we're all together and we came together just before lockdown and have, have seen the past year and a half three together. So, um, so yeah, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal thing we're doing. Yeah, I'm very impressed with Turf. It's a great organisation. Uh, well done with that. Um, Emily, welcome to this morning. Hello, everyone. Yes, I'm Emily Gibbon. I am the bid, uh, bid Business Engagement Manager for Gloucester Business Improvement District. I've been in place since November last year. And previous to that, I was the bid manager for Exeter um, during a chaotic year last year but again brought people together getting through this crisis and now I'm back in Gloucester supporting the businesses and the community here and trying to work out what happens next. Excellent good to have you with us uh, and Nigel last but definitely not least. Uh, thank you very much uh, good morning everyone uh, my name is Nigel Jobson I'm Com Chief Co uh, Commercial Officer at Maybe. Uh, Maybe is a social listening and engagement platform that helps you do social better and to sell more and to drive people down and back onto the high street. Uh, we work with lots of local authorities, shopping centres, retailers up and down the country. And um, I also sit on the Rebo Strategic Board, which is a shopping centre membership organisation. So I get to hear some of those uh, top nuggets from, uh, from the big FTSE 100 uh, uh, landlords who are uh, wondering what to do at the moment. Uh, and I also chair the uh, G First Retail sector group um, uh, across the whole of Gloucestershire. So uh, um, lots to talk about today and uh, it should be some very interesting conversations. Thank you, Nigel. Um, if you're wondering, Louise is doing all the, all the stuff behind the scenes for us. So thank you, Louise. Louise is from Business Insights. Um, I should say that I work for the FSB, Federation of Small Businesses, which for those that may not know it, is Britain's biggest business representation group. And we cover absolutely every sector, including, of course, retail. So the high street is very, very important to us. But um, do you know what? Because we represent um, small businesses and, and they're all mainly independent and mainly locally based, they've all got a stake in this. It's not just about retail. It's not just about restaurants. It's not just about hotels. It's not just about pubs. Every business wants to see their own local community do well. And one of the actual um, you know, key points of that is to have a successful high street. So um, using that as a, as a backdrop, when we talk about the, the, the high street, um, what images does that bring to people's mind when, when people talk about the whole, what, what, what do you think about when you think high street? Um, Lindsay, what about you? What do you think? 
Um, it conjures up two different angles, actually. It conjures up a childhood image of, of the excitement of going to, because I was in a small village, so to go into town, to go to the town and walk down the high street and on a Saturday was, was really exciting because you got to see so many people and different things. Um, and as an adult, it, it feels like it's, we've, we've gone through the sort of out of town retail and, and we're coming back. And I think that's, that's the bit where I find it really exciting now, because I feel like we're, we're heading back towards that sort of community hub. The idea that in actual fact, going to the high street is something to look forward to because it's a full of independence, something a little bit different, finding that gift for somebody that maybe you can't find online or something. And I've, I've, I'm hoping and I'm really pushing and working towards that being the next the next area for the high street, having having seen them slightly obliterated sadly over the past past years. Bringing back some of that magic that you experienced as a child, I, I, I totally totally agree with that. That's a, a great image. What, what about you, Claire? When you think high streets, what's the first? What do you see in your mind when you think high streets? Well, I think that I'm, I'm old. I'm the oldest one on the panel by far. Um, yeah. But I uh, <laughs> by far. But I, it is absolutely right. High streets used to simply be retail because there wasn't the internet in my day. And interestingly, I used to work for a design agency in Cheltenham 30 years ago and we were approached by one of our clients Asta and they said oh we'd heard about this thing called the internet we're quite not quite sure what you know what that's going to do to our business and could you could your designers imagine what the future is going to look like so actually interestingly the designers kind of uh, created um, an image of what shopping would be like and it's pretty much where we need to be looking to the basis behind that was that when this magic thing called the internet came, everybody would do their commodity shopping online, but shopping is still very social. We still want to go out. We want to talk to people. We want to taste and touch produce, etc. So the designers all those years ago had this vision that actually it was about experiences. So that when you went into this vision of Asda in years to come, you would actually have the cheese, but with the cheese, you could taste the cheese. There would be something that you'd interact with and that would tell you what wine went with what cheese. So it's much more of a social experience. Um, and I think that's pretty much where we've got to start looking at. It's, it can't be just about shopping because, especially post COVID, because so many people now have got used to shopping online. So how can we make that high street different? And I think a really good um, example is create on the square for those of you that are watching that know Cheltenham Coronation Square has had its challenges. And Lizzie George did an amazing piece of work there. There was an empty shop. The whole place was in a, a complete spiraling downwards. You know, there was graffiti. The shops were shutting. It was desperate. But what she did was insightful. And I think there's a lesson there for us all to learn. She took that empty space. She went to the landlords and said, can I just use that space? It's empty anyway. Just give me six months. I can get it going. And she created that community hub. So she was engaging with the local community. They were going in, they were doing arts and crafts, they had a coffee shop in the corner. They were encouraging people to work, hot desk. Um, and the rest is history. I mean, that just became so buzzy and created so, many, so much football. And interesting, everybody said, well, you're going to have bricks through the window. Nobody's going to like it. Complete opposite. This is where the community took ownership and they loved it. And they started planting up the planters. And on the back of that, because of the footfall, suddenly WH Smiths opened a shop there because they knew they got the footfall. So actually, you're absolutely right in your intro, Sam. So much of this is not just about retail. It's about experiences. It's about involving the community and even encouraging more people to live in our towns. I think that would be so useful to get people back into that community. So that's just a you know, couple of uh, case studies there. No, lovely. And we'll, we'll probably come back to that about what we can do in terms of non-retail to bring our towns to life again a little bit later. But Emily, what about you? Growing up, was um, was the high street important to you with the, the trip to the, the town or the city for that you look forward to? Yeah, well, it's weird. I'm looking back. I, I didn't really like going shopping at, at random. I just, I just didn't engage with the, the high street that way. I saw it as a day out. Um, I think because my parents didn't really like going shopping, it sort of come through to me. That being, I don't, I don't shop online. I go out and support all the local independents and what I need to, I buy in the high street because I know the knock-on effect of it. But the high street now, I, it's, it is more of a community. It is socialising. The people I've spoken to recently, they're just like, I can't wait to see you out on the high street, out in the coffee shop, catch up. Yeah, probably talk about COVID and the past years, what's gone on and what's gone wrong and what can go right. 
but the amount of people who've just missed people and that's that's come through from everyone even the retailers they've just missed seeing people not necessarily people buying things obviously that would really help their business but it's that engagement with their customers that they've really missed out on and sadly some of the businesses that haven't got the digital infrastructure or the know-how have really shrunk because they haven't had that on one-to-one like continuous conversation with their customers with their partners it's it's a shame but with the last month people are, are looking forward to just getting to know their customers again their new ones but it people ask me what's going to happen and I've got no idea I really don't we, we can only predict but then we were predicting predicting the, the um the death of the high street two years ago and this curveball came in and completely put us off kilter and accelerated so many different aspects of the decline of the high street I think it's a good chance for us to start fresh and bring the community back into the high street and what Claire was saying about that empty shop people will respect things that have got care for if people put love and attention into a place it will gain respect and people who walk past will go oh actually this is a nice place so we've, we've got to stop comparing and start caring for our places a great line stop comparing stop caring Nigel follow that <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think what all's been said so far is, is absolutely true I think um, somewhere along the line, I think trying to work out what what perfect looks like. I think it's all about tailoring the offer to the local population. I think uh, I'm as guilty as as, as some. Uh, I go back to my uh, property days. I used to work for Jones Lang LaSalle in London, and um, I used to cover the southwest. And my main objective was to put big um, retailers into prime spots and create the biggest rent possible, and then that would disseminate and make all the rents go up and make landlords load of money. And then basically what happens is when the when those nationals fall by the wayside, you get big holes appearing across all those high streets. And I think when everyone asks me, well, what's the future of the high street? If you took away the the fixed costs on a high street and if that was rates and rent, for example, and said, right, we're going to start from scratch and it's purely a either a turnover or a hybrid of the turnover relationship on the high street, uh, there'll be relatively swift regeneration of, the, of all these spots. It's just property takes so long to regenerate takes so much money whereas digital relatively speaking you can just flick a switch and you know you're into a different um, space altogether um so i think it, it's 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 melding the perfect blend of, of digital and physical understanding your 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 neighborhood and curating and offering that and providing that to the local population you know what what the cheltenham offer um needs to be is going to be different to uh, gloucester doesn't make it any better or worse it's just you're tailoring it to the local population. Don't make it vanilla all round. And I think that's where a lot of the shopping centres have struggled recently. When you lose those standard, not very exciting retailers, and you're left with a, you know, a, a big a big hole in your portfolio. So I think it's it's go back a few steps, regroup, and um, I'm excited um, for the future. But um, it's it's going to be painful. Yeah, it's good, good to hear that about the excitement because I I, I do I do sense that as well. Uh, and I think actually COVID has, has changed. It's changed a lot. We'll go, we'll go straight into that in a minute. But um, the, what you said as well was quite interesting about the, the, the relationship between bigger stores and smaller stores. I mean, obviously, representing the FSB, we're flag waving for every independent possible, but they need the big stores as well. Yeah. And I remember going back years and years, maybe five years ago, I went to, uh, to Tewkesbury High Street and one of the retailers there told me that their, their takings were down an independent place. And I said, do you know why? And he pointed to the empty blockbuster store that shows how long ago this was and i said really he says you'd be amazed how many people popped into the town to get a dvd they're parking for free for 20 minutes or an hour what are they going to do with the rest of it they're coming to stop cycles the moment blockbuster closed we closed so some people have a very idealistic view they can just have totally independence but no you need your double eight smiths you need your boots you need your bigger stores to bring the small ones in and that combination is important but um i also picked up on what claire was saying about um lizzie george's place is saying cheltenham and and i think i when i think about a bookstore for example and i'm going to talk about a national chain in terms of waterstones by rights waterstones should no longer exist what was the first thing jeff bezos did when he created amazon he, he produced books half the price of waterstones waterstones should have been wiped off the face of the planet but what they've done is you go in there now and you there's armchairs you can sit in they have visiting um, authors when they're allowed to do things like that. There's a lovely coffee shop up the top. It's an experience and it's that feel of buying. I, I, I still get from a, a relative a Waterstones token every Christmas. And I can't tell you, it's the easiest thing in the world to pick up a phone and order something. The pleasure I get 
with my little token walking into a shop um, and actually doing that. And I think that's something that you can't replicate online. But um, but coming back to uh, that, that link that, that COVID has done, I think maybe you could argue that the, the relationship between ourselves and local shops and, and the high street and so forth was going only one way pre-COVID. But I've got a feeling that people's opinions changed during COVID because they had to stay local. They weren't going to the outer centre places. So maybe they were rediscovering their town centres, their high streets, there were shops that were open. Um, how have you all perceived COVID has changed people's relationship with local, I'm going to call, I'm going to call retailers, but I'm going to include maybe restauranters, takers, everybody like that. So have you seen a difference? I'll start again with Lindsay on this one. Have you, do you think COVID has brought some positive changes? I do. I think it's, I think it's probably maybe a little bit too soon to see exactly what the fallout will be because I'm I, I guess my my concern is that whilst everybody was going out for a walk and all of a sudden um cafes turned into a lifeline instead of it being sort of oh well should we have a coffee not have a coffee all of a sudden it was we're going for a walk and we're having a coffee because it was the only thing you could do and a couple of our turf members sort of turned into these phenomenal places because you could actually go and get a coffee and a bagel and it felt normal and it was it was those things to do so that that's been an, an amazing positive um and being able to open outdoors it's just flooded in to the point where in actual fact um one of our members on monday said we're so glad everybody else is opening can we have a rest now it's you know everybody's been so enthusiastic to get back out there and the wonderful pictures of people sitting in the rain. I mean, honestly, there. No matter what's been going on, I think people have just been wanting that contact so badly. So, so that's been fantastic because obviously it's bringing people into the town centre. But in one sense, it will only last for so long because we will all get back to doing things with the kids and going out at weekends and 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 doing whatever we need to do. But it was interesting, I thought, your comments of a, of a younger person and, and what they were saying about the future of the high street, because that to me is something that's so imperative. We, it, we, we, our sort of generation might pop back in because they're interested in doing bits and pieces, but the high street will only survive as long as we keep going to it. We need it to survive forever. And I think it's, it's that younger market that we've got to somehow engage because they're not interested in going out for dinner at 18 you know they just mm. want to hang out with their friends or whatever and I think that's where we we need to bring them into the high street in some way shape or form so it doesn't feel so alien to them when they get into their 20s and their 30s that in actual fact going to the high street is is a normal thing to do I think if we miss out at that point in in their evolution we we could well lose it yeah I, th I think you I think you're absolutely right and I think uh I love those images of Brit British people drinking when it's pouring the rain. Uh, I'm a big Bruce Springsteen fan, and I can't think of a song "Dancing in the Dark" without thinking of "Drinking in the Drizzle," which is what I, I, which is how I perceive so many people were doing it. But, but you're right, and and I think, um, do you know what I think? I think a lot of people have found that they, they've been buying things online. And I can only speak of family members or anecdotally, and and sometimes you've got clothes and shoes. What you you sometimes have to try these things on. And I've got a feeling people might want that again, that sort of how to go and have a feel and what looks very good on, on, a, on, a, on a screen may not look so very good when you're standing in that changing room. And, you, and people will want that kind of thing again. So um, that's what I'm hoping. But, but yeah. Nigel, what, what positives do you think have emerged over the last 12 months of, 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 of depressing things going on that might affect, you know, how we see our high streets and local communities in the future? Sorry, Sam, is that one for me? Yeah, sorry, no, Joe, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I think the the innovative thought process that that you know, lots of people are trying stuff. Lots of people, you know, that, you know, watching all the pop up, you know, particularly around food and bev around uh, Cheltenham. You know, they, I didn't realise there were so many marquee opportunities uh, uh, in and around town, and uh, you know, you know, people using those to to venture and push the boundaries of how they can engage with their audience. So I think the you know the the accelerated firestorm that's gone through the market i think has been a good thing because i think this is this you know this is a journey that we're on anyway and um you know to condense what would have happened in five years to to 18 months is probably not a bad thing it feels you know it feels painful and there will be a lot of people licking their wounds on the back of it but i think it's given everyone a, a kick up the uh, you know various parts of the rear end um um to 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 enable them to take those steps forward that we needed to do so i, th I think you know continuous innovation is is here to stay 
um, and understanding and, and learning and having that relationship with your customers is what you're saying, Lindsay. You know, you've got different customers coming in. How you know? How do you make sure that you're you're going to continue to have that long term relationship with them? If you know, if it's a bid area or if it's you know happily, how do you how do you continue to to embed yourself in the in the understanding of those customers because everyone wants a more direct relationship these days. I think the days of sort of you know, I don't get very excited about going into a supermarket and washing around and coming back out again. I get particularly exci- um, unexcited. Whereas if I go to a food hall, I get really excited because I can smell it, I can taste it, I can see what other people's reactions are. Um, and you know, I think it, it's, I think that's how that's the journey that I think we're going to be going on um, going forward. So um, again, yeah, e- excitement. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think if you if you take it wider into the entertainment sphere, we've all been watching Netflix all year and stuff, but. There's nothing like being in a comedy gig when other people are laughing. There's nothing like being in a horror film when everyone's jumping out of their seats. There's, there's that communal feeling that I think we've all missed. And, and live stream concerts are not the same as being there and feeling the sweat and, you know, well, that's probably just me. But uh, it, it, it is a whole different thing, isn't it? It's a whole different thing. I think I was also going to say something. I think also, you know, with, you know, lots of Zoom calls, lots of digital stuff. I think sometimes you need to get a benchmark in your, in, you know, in your day. You know, and that's, you know, that used to be, you know, Thursday night or Friday night going out, going down to the shops on a Saturday and doing stuff, you know, and having these little pegs in the week. Whereas if, it, if, it, if you're living a purely, you know, self-contained, one focused, you know, Zoom life, yeah. um, it just turns into a blur, I think. And I've, I've really enjoyed the, you know, the, the first steps of getting out there and going and seeing some of my friends and going out and having a meal. And you can, you suddenly get your, you get your voom back, I think, a little bit of that. Emily, what's got your vava boom back? What, what have you seen that's been good? As you say, you were in Exeter before and, yeah. and you were there at the, the height of these things going on. You're back in Gloucester now. What yeah. positives amongst all the negatives that we know about have you seen? I think the positive signs are when the crisis hit, everyone was stunned. But businesses who used that time where they couldn't open to reevaluate themselves, reevaluate their business and learn have done tremendously well. There were a few businesses in in Exeter that were not trading online prior to COVID. They were thinking about it, but since that crisis hit, they were like, right, we've got to do this. We've got to get online, working with different partners. So they did a group way of a small delivery. So a a line of shops altogether did a sort of click and collect where they would uh, offer businesses to, a person to buy from each business and then deliver it themselves, which was fantastic. And I think, the community having to stay at home they have fallen in love with their places again or realize what's on their doorstep what they didn't know before so so i don't know how many people work from home for gloucester but i know that there were a lot more people based here looking and walking around the docks walking around the cathedral walking in and out all the different alleys that we've got and finding the different businesses and going oh i didn't know that was there and that's just sparked a love and again i think everyone's sort of a bit more grounded and realised what's on their doorstep and their history of things. Admittedly, I've got a different hat on being a trustee for historic buildings, but people have got a bit more respect for their place and their, their businesses and the, the structure of their city or, or their town and wanted to re-engage with what was there previously. And um, because the weather is so, so, and like what's happening now, crikey, we're going to lose it. What was there before? How can we protect it for later on? there is a bit more passion and sort of grounding for people of where they live and a bit more respect of what goes on there. Um, that's what I've positive that's come out for me anyway, as well as many other things. <laughs> and I think you're right. If people can fall back in love with their town centres or their villages or their high streets, then that's going to help the very businesses we're talking about today. So how about you, Claire? What have you been encouraged by? Or... I've been scribbling notes while everybody's talking, <laughs> Sam. Um, I really think there's some good things to come out of COVID. I think people have had this as a time to reflect and reassess what's important. I think food and drink is going to be a major part of this. I'm bound to say that working for a company that's passionate about food and drink it happily. But, um, you know, there nothing beats that experience. And I live in a little market town called Pershaw and they've got a little indoor market. And it was one of the reasons I chose to live there. And interestingly, Pershaw's High Street is always busy because people are drawn to the market. The three days that the market is open is busy. And what that actually means is that people are 
thinking a little bit more about buying, lo thinking local and buying local. And a lot of the produce in there is all local. They're, if you ask the butcher or the greengrocer where that produce comes, they can literally name the farm. And people are much more aware now about health and well-being and eating well. They've had the time to cook properly, which a lot of people haven't had up until now. So people are making their banana bread or whatever it might be. So, um, and I also think from a sustainability perspective, if you support, think local and buy local, if you can go and buy one parsnip, you, you're less likely to have the food waste. You're not coping with all these excess packaging, etc. So I really hope there might be a bit of a swing back to some of those old fashioned values that we kind of lost before. Um, and let's, you know, look in France, look at the, the success of those farmers markets and even a pop up farmers market, um, how much footfall that can bring into a town. Mm. And certainly happily, we've been looking at some unused space where, for example, say a large BHS has, has shut and how to repurpose that space and do something differently. And I was actually in Stroud last weekend and went to the Five Valleys and what they've done there with food and drink, it's so exciting. Why wouldn't you go there? It's more of a destination than just a retail experience. So I think there's some really good positive things to come out of this. Yeah, I'm looking forward to going to Stroud. It looks incredible. That one shop, I don't think there's anything I can afford in it, but it looks wonderful. Uh, it's just got that kind of feel to it. It's, uh, it's a remarkable place. but. Um, but but if you look at it, we can't pretend there's not some challenges out there. There's quite a lot of challenges. I don't know if you all saw the BBC report at the weekend that said 10% of restaurants have closed and aren't coming back. And, and as I think Lindsay pointed out at, at the start, we don't know how much more that's going to go on because as businesses come back, they might not be able to um, um, recruit. This is a thing I keep hearing from business. And if you all picked up on this again, if you're a chef, if you're watching this as a chef, name your price then um I, I was on a call yesterday with all my colleagues from the southwest in places like cornwall and devon they are really struggling they've got all these places open and no one, no one to cook your food um and i think that's because a lot of people left that industry during the last 12 months and realized they didn't want to go back to it so there are some challenges so we've lost all these restaurants potentially um should we always look to replace them or is this the time to think that we shouldn't just because a place closes it shouldn't be replaced by something the same. So, um, Lindsay, this is an area you know particularly well. The ten percent figures does that surprise you? Would you have thought it'd be more or less? Or, um, I think looking nationally, it's really hard to say because obviously everywhere is really different. In terms of Cheltenham and Turf, we've actually come through okay. There's only there was we've only lost one um, at the moment, and I say at the moment because in actual fact, things like deferring the VAT payments, all the rent debt, all of those bits and pieces are about to come, well, not about to, but this year, everything will obviously have to come back um, and be paid, not paid, however this turns out. And at that point, I think we might see a lot more fail. Um, and, and that's the slight issue. And as much as everybody thinks, open the doors, people come in, job done, we're fine. It's not at all. There's a lot of background um, and debt that, that's owing. So from that point of view, 10%, yeah, talk about it in a year's time and then maybe we'll see some true figures. Um, but I, I think what's really interesting and, and kind of going back to the previous conversation, but also looking forwards in terms of in terms of how turf feels about the high street, we want to see people able to come in and have an experience. They're not going to be able to have an experience if the high street is 90% food and beverage and 10% everything else. We need to have the variety. And I think the slight concern in Cheltenham at the moment, not that you can have, have too much hospitality, but it's just if we keep changing the purpose of retail over to hospitality, what's the reason for people to come into town? We've got a wonderful theatre, we've got more than one wonderful theatre, but we've got a cinema. But people have got to have a need to be in town and you can only go... How many restaurants can you eat at in a week? How many nightclubs? How many pubs? How many drinks do you want to have in a week? We've got to have different reasons. So I think the whole purpose of, or, or rather changing the purpose of buildings that are maybe sitting vacant at the moment needs to be really thought out. Like having happily is just very off to the side in some ways because it's not a traditional shop or it's not a traditional food and beverage, but it's the kind of thing that will get people in and then they'll think, actually, should we have a coffee whilst we're in or should we do something else? So from that point of view, I think it's just, there's a lot of, why don't we try it around? Mm. And I think from pop-ups through to whatever, because ironically, everybody's going, what's the worst that could happen? Because none of us saw COVID coming <laughs> and we've survived. And if we've got this far, let's try something else. And so I think that sort of 
ability to be quite dynamic needs to be reflected now from the councils and from the landlords in the planning permissions in the ability of changing the, the usage of buildings to keep the the variety going in the high street yeah I, th I think that's a very very fair point I, I i think one of the things we've been having to do talking to various stakeholders and that is to is to tell them this isn't over um just because the business has survived thus far a lot of people are saying well that's it look people had all these doomsday scenarios it's not that bad well now it starts to hit um a very simple example i, I needed to change my car and i did so middle of last year because i wasn't having so many outgoings well suddenly all my outgoings are starting to go up again i'm thinking all oh, that car loads begin to hit me if you're a business that is all the loans that you've all the things that you've deferred your vat councils have been bending over backwards giving out grants that's starting to need to be paid back again yeah. and a lot of people also i mentioned staffing again and and you may have picked up on this yourself that a lot of people are bringing people out of furlough and they're not coming back um they're not they're they're, they're deciding they just like the um, Claire mentioned that, uh, or it might have been Emily, that people had time to think over the last 12 months. Well, a lot of employees have had time to think as well, and they're thinking they're not going to go back. Absolutely. And just and going back to that, it's, it's sort of hospitality in one sense has survived the pandemic, but we didn't have the, the, um, the phenomenal staffing um, when we went into it. So from that point of view, we were already short staffed since when we've had Brexit and the pandemic. So the fact that this is now uber exaggerated isn't a surprise to us, but to everybody out there, it's kind of like, oh, oh, that's a bit of a problem. Like, well, no, we saw this coming. <laughs> it's just, we're a little bit tired to do anything about it because we need to sort of, well, this isn't a different soapbox, but you know, we need to change the, the image of hospitality so that everybody sees it for the, the phenomenal career it can be, as opposed to the, job you do whilst you're waiting for a proper job you know it's it the, the whole persona of it needs to change um and we've got a lot of work to do in the industry but we're you know we're doing it but yeah there's there's a long way to go that's a very, very good point and, and and emily you know gloucester town center probably better than anyone what what sort of business how, how, how many businesses do you think we've lost that, that you would have been dealing with if you were doing that job this time last year how many restaurants or, or retail units just haven't come back or aren't like to come back? Well, sadly, we've lost quite a few uh, nationals, which were on the decline anyway. Obviously, the Debenhams has been the big one and really positive news with the university taking it up like that. Um, there is, there's a lot of shift, though. The gloss is quite positive at the moment. We've been very lucky, touch wood, at the moment that we haven't seen that, that much decline or people were shutting up the people are, who have closed up are ones that have wanted to move on or try something different rather than because their business has failed we've seen someone's blossom we've had a great story from one that was in the the indoor market they purchased a unit on the high street and they're doing really well so it's a really positive action on that the knock-on effect of the university taking debenhams up we've got some units that were empty on oxbow were empty for ages have been snapped up and businesses have gone in there those are um, beauty salons and things that people go out and have an experience on, which is, is very positive. I think the next six months with, as you say, business rates coming back in again, furlough ending, we're definitely not out of the woods. And I don't want to be a miserable one, but we have to be really careful and, and businesses need to, to realise there's more of this to, to come and they need to prepare for it and plan um, the um, businesses are really excited to be open the hospitality opening this they're indoors this this week because most of our pubs just don't have the outdoor space in Gloucester so they've opened the doors I think there was a slight anti-climax and I think the, the weather really played a big part in that not bringing people out and there wasn't a, as mad rushed back to the indoor hospitality as there was to the the retail opening up last week last week last month even um, but I, I think we've got the whole summer to play with and I think that's where we need to reevaluate what we can offer those customers the experience that they come in what else is going on in the high street in the city over the summer with the events coming back in again albeit social distance fingers crossed everything goes all right um it's it's interesting it's a really good vibe in gloucester at the moment um but we just need to keep our eye on on everything it's tough yeah I, I totally agree with that i think the next six months are absolutely key and we really really do need the weather to be on our favor I, th I seem to remember this time last year when lockdown was started it was beautiful we were I, I remember going for walks every night after work and it was just lovely and you just think it was the one good thing that kept us going in that first few months but we really mm -hmm. need that now for our businesses so so nigel if 
if potentially 10% of restaurants have gone, um, and I agree with you, I think it, it does seem that it's national chains rather than local ones, but um, will they be replaced? Should they be replaced? Or is this just part of the natural evolution of, of hospitality and retail? Um, I, was, I was having a conversation yesterday with um, um, uh, a landlord that was looking to redevelop a, a large swathe of North London, and they were sort of scratching their head, heads as to, you know, where should they start? And um, I think sometimes we can get challenged with trying to over curate places. Um, and I think I'm, I'm more of a natural forces kind of individual, you know, you know, for me to predict what the next new wave of retailing offer or the next new wave of food offer. If you wind the clock back 10 years ago and you said, well, you know, um, you know, all the job descriptions that have come out of digital have all been created out of thin air in essence, but they, you know, they are bodified a jobs going forward. And, they, and it, I think it's just sort of taking, taking one step back and not trying to over curate and say, you know, a burger chain has gone bust. We need to replace it with another burger chain. Well, you know, the customer is always right and the customer can be a bit fickle. Uh, and I think it's, again, it's having that relationship with your customer to know, you know, that you need to change the, change the menu in a particular direction. If there's too many pizza operators in town, go for falafel or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. If the beer is being produced in one particular direction, go for, you know, rum and coke over there. Um, so I think being light footed and, you know, going back to my, my hometown of Cheltenham, you know, if you look at the, you know, those little pockets, those little quarters, which have never been overly appreciated, you know, the lower end of the high street where all those sort of, um, you know, you know, Polish and uh, Asian food stores is, um, I keep cycling down there and I don't, I haven't seen anybody go bust. Um, the reason being is they're providing an offer to a local community that, that appreciates them and they've got a one-to-one -one relationship with, um, they haven't got overly excited about having huge, great grand premises. And I think keeping a lid on it um, and just being cautiously um, evolutionary um, with the offer. And that goes for, you know, what's happening in Gloucester, what's happening in, in any town in the country is test it, try it and build on it rather than, trying to get too much wholesale swathes of redevelopment. And um, yeah, so I, I, th I think that I, there, there will be replacements in the, you know, in those restaurants that have fallen by the wayside, but I personally, I'll, I'll be a little bit more cautious. And I think it's what, what Lindsay was saying is, you know, if, if there's too much of a good thing, um, you know, everyone falls by the wayside. And I think that's what happened with retail and it's happened with F and B. And when retail businesses get too big, they get too much debt. Um, and they get saddled with lots of other costs and they, you know, they've, they've got shaky foundations. And I think it's, um, you know, and I think pointing back to your organisation, Sam, you know, FSB, providing that business uh, expertise as we go through this and all those learnings that a business needs to understand around, you know, debt repayments and restructuring and making sure that they're financially sound as they journey forward, I think will be as critical. And I think it's for local authorities to to help in that process as well not only about handing out, you know, hard cash, great, but are you, you know, is your business well set up? Is it, is it, is it, is it, has it got those strong foundations for if there's an, another lockdown or if there's a, you know, COVID Mark II version that comes through forward? So I think that's my, um, that's my thoughts. Yeah, it's interesting. F and B always remind me of Frankie and Benny's. And <laughs> that's a store that's gone in Gloucester. And I never quite understood why. There's a couple on that St. Oswald Park that have gone. And I never quite understood why, because they both seem to be doing quite well. So, Again, though, it's a bigger change. Watch the space because they're going to be filled again soon. So, oh, yeah. Thank you. Sir. That's what I like these things for. Inside info. Brilliant. And um, what about you, Claire? Are you, are you worried about that that stat, that BBC stat, ten percent of restaurants are going, or did it surprise? Um, yeah, I I kind of think the core issue here is about the need to collaborate. So I think Lindsay, what she's doing with Turf is amazing because this old mentality of all their competition can't talk to them. Actually, if we collaborate, and the work that Nigel's doing in terms of monitoring the destination, because, you know, Cheltenham's a destination, Gloucester's a destination, and the Association of Gloucestershire Business Groups was set up because I'd moved back up from Cornwall, had done a lot of work with Visit Cornwall, and it's kind of how do we empower the smaller towns, they haven't got a bid, they haven't got a marketing Cheltenham to support them, how can we help those smaller towns to manage themselves as a destination, and I had a great case study because I was chair for Winchester Business Forum, so of course I went in there with great ideas, but the one thing that I said to them all, you know, what are you doing digitally, and this is why what Nigel's doing is fantastic, it because so many of those oh well, we haven't got a website oh no we're not on social media well how do people know you're there well the, the litmus test for that was that they'd all moaned about the road surface in Winchcombe people weren't going to Winchcombe because the road was bad so they had 12 months notice knowing that the road was going to be closed 
So I get hauled into a meeting saying, well, what are you going to do about this? And, you know, businesses suffer. I said, well, what have you been doing online? Where have you been building up your digital presence to offset that? Because you knew you had 12 months. Oh, we, we, that's not relevant for us. So then we started to look at Winchcombe and creating a, a website for Winchcombe, which actually was the go-to website. So it wasn't just about retail. It wasn't just a space for the shops, but it had Sudley Castle on there, which was obviously the honeypot to get people into that town. Um, and I had the most ridiculous conversations where I was talking to a, one shop that was opposite, a really nice, lovely little Cotswold pub that remained nameless. And I was talking to them and I said, you know, are you working with them? And could you put some of your art in there maybe and refer it to drop, make people cross the road to come into to you? La, la, la. Oh, no, 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 no. They're, they're hospitality and we're retail. So we don't want to work with them. So the whole concept behind AGBG was trying to get the business group that happened to be in that town to create that hub, to create those conversations, to not just sit there thinking, well, it's the landlord's issue or it's the, it's the council's issue, but actually get the private sector working together to have a single voice to digitally promote itself. Um, and it was a nightmare, but hopefully after COVID, and Lindsay, I'm really looking to what you're doing with Turf because it's so exciting. We've got to stop thinking in silos. We've got to work together. And this is our time because sense of place is important. And that's the one thing I learned working with DMOs, destination management organizations, is we as locals love the town or place in which we live. And we're the best ambassadors to encourage other people to come in. So it's changing that mentality, which is going to take time but um hopefully we'll get there but certainly winchcombe for a case study and i urge anybody i'm not obviously that i'm promoting you all to go rush into winchcombe go shopping but if you look at their website and how they've made it fully inclusive so they've got the charities on there they've got the events on there they've got the businesses who for a small amount of money can have a listing on there so that then becomes a directory for the for the town which is fantastic because if you're new and they've built a lot of new houses they actually will go to that website. Oh, I need such and such. Oh, look, I didn't know I could buy that in the town. So that digital presence, and I, you know, I invite Nigel to sort of back me up on that, but I really, really, really think ignore it at your peril. So even as a small business, what are you doing digitally? But as a town and a destination, what are you doing? Exactly. Well, and that will lead us very nicely into the next question. Thank you for that, Claire. That was amazing. And yet, I, I think we start with the premise that digital is not the enemy of the high street. It is, it can be its biggest support. And I'll, I'll give you a, a, a great case study. Um, those of you who may know the, the place in Gloucester, I'm sure Emily knows them. There's a, it's a candle shop in Gloucester called the Candle Tree. Now, um, I got to know them because um, they used to have a little place in the Forest of Dean uh, uh, and my wife likes candles. So we'd go over there sometimes, we'd chat to the lady, Sandra, lovely lady. And she was so passionate about candles. And she talked about coming to Gloucester and we are trying to sell its virtues to her and everything. Uh, and she set up and she's got this beautiful looking store, COVID hit. She hasn't been in operation very long. What she's done by using social media and by keeping in contact with the one-to-one -one contacts that Nigel was talking about, he's kept that business alive. And so my wife has ordered things from her online and she's delivered it to the door unbelievable you know and i just think so what she's done by staying alive online is meant that that shop will now continue to be viable but she's got an online business and i think that i feel is a future so there's no better person to talk about this than than, than nigel um because what maybe do is amazing anyone's watching this and don't know maybe look it up it's an incredible uh, organization and what it does for communities is brilliant so nigel for those that may be watching from a high school practice who might still be thinking no my shop is is my domain i'm not interested in that internet thingy tell them why they're wrong uh you know th thanks for uh, your, your complimentary uh, thoughts uh no um maybe it's um social listening and engagement platform so basically we we pick up all those openly available conversations around twitter instagram and facebook and we enable you to understand you know where you sit within your uh, local ecosystem in terms of you you know you know if you're uh, a butcher you know what's the voice of the um um, you know, the conversation around artisan um, foods, for example, you know, for, for Happily, or if it's a F and b offer, you know, where does your voice sit within the, the community of uh, restaurateurs around your town? And then really understand, you know, how you want to use social to engage with your customer and your audience, because ultimately it is about those one-on-one -on -one relationships. If you look at all of the, the big online brands that are doing really, really well through COVID, it's, it's having a one-to-one -one direct, direct relationship with your your uh, customers so you know someone like Gymshark 
they're constantly engaging them they're not shouting at their customer they're having a one-to-one -one relationship if someone like primark primark don't have a e-commerce platform because they want to drive people into their stores and they're constantly engaging with them even through lockdown we could we were watching their social engagement and activity and it was absolutely rock solid mm -hmm. and then when the stores reopen bosh everyone's down there because they've had continued that relationship with them um you know it goes you know i remember um uh, ian mean um who we were chatting with a couple of years ago and he, he hit the nail on the head you know he's a he's an old um uh you know press hack and uh, you know he would go along to an event and his in his day he would take a picture and he would do some copy and he'd push it out well that's what you're doing on social now but everybody has the opportunity of doing that so if you've got a great food offer take a you know take a picture um, do your do your copy on Instagram and push it out and people can understand what you are doing that that morning that afternoon that evening and engage with you and when somebody mentions um, mentions you or they tag you in pick up on that and, and join the connected conversation we're all talking about community here and it's what Emily's doing over in Gloucester it's what you're doing Claire it's what you're doing Lindsay and, and FSB it's all about everybody working together for the common goal rather than lot of a lot of the national brands if you look at the ones that have failed and we do a we, we we do a national ranking in terms of the engagement and the businesses that have traded really well over christmas and the ones that have fallen by the wayside that you know toys r us and the like toys r us didn't even have an instagram account um and you think hold on you've got a you know 25 to 35 year old mum who likes Instagram, who likes social, and you're not even talking to them in their own channel, in their own language. Mm. And, it's, and it's very, very easy to see the correlation between the brands which are doing really, really well. And it's a bit like your comment about Waterstones. They talk about their books, they talk about their authors all the time. It's a very, very engaging community and they've reaped the benefits from it. Um, buying a book on Amazon is very, very easy, but it's not, a, it's not an experience, is it? And um, we're, in, you know, we're in a new, a new, a new territory. So uh, yeah, so we, you know we've got some um, fantastic um, analytics up and down the country. You know, still only twenty eight percent of um, businesses, small independent businesses, um, actually use social media, and only fifty percent of those use it on a daily basis. So you know, we're here to you know champion the cause and basically say, look, you know, get yourself set up, understand, learn, and everybody can lift the bar, and, and we can help um, all those communities back on the high street. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it, it, we're, we're, none of us are hypocrites here. We've all bought books on Amazon and we, and we appreciate its convenience and so forth. But the most depressing sight to me, and we've all seen it, I'm sure, if you go into a Waterstones and watch people taking pictures of the front covers of books that they obviously decide they want to buy and then going home and ordering online. I think, that's, I think it should be fined as they leave. But anyway, that's, that's a personal thing. But and by the way, there's nothing wrong with old press hacks. There's a few of us around. No, no. Um, no. <laughs> I, I, but it, but be careful, Nigel. <laughs> no, no, no I to totally appreciate that. But it, it, it blend, blending old and new, it's all about, you know, you know we've, we've, we've okay. got such a blinkered view that the, you know, the new is, you know, the only way. It's not take the best of the old and, and, and pull it in there and, and use it. So absolutely. Nigel, right. You just said that the most current word, which is blend, which I think is where mm -hmm. everything needs to be like online, offline efforts you know food and beverages with retail it's that blended experience that are going to bring people back in and it's it's getting that message out to people that they can do that in their store or people can enjoy all sorts of things in a destination it's just it just takes time for people to sort of get you have, have you actually encountered active resistance from some of the traders you deal with when you say you consider setting up an online portal or going websites or whatever or are most people now embracing that as an essential part of their business was that to me sorry no, I was sorry yeah just yeah. Yeah. yeah i think i think the resistance is because they don't understand it i think that's really it and if there is someone just to train them up how simple it is to sell online and walk it through with them i know two shops in gloucester that will do really well online but they're just a bit too nervous to to branch out on it One's testing the water with doing click and collect, which is great, and doing that by Facebook. But the the two, they're both niches and you know specialities in the, in their field in Gloucester. That if they had a bit more presence online, would do so much better. But it's just in, encouraging them to go. It is the right thing. There are people to help you. You've also just got to put a bit of effort into it as well. It's, yeah, yeah. I, th I think I think also you know especially you know I, I've come from a a relatively non-digital world in my in my previous guys you know I was, I was building stores around the world in a physical format um, but the same theory applies to that so I was, I was going along in my 
position at, as a property director at Superdry, and I was putting the Superdry stores in the busiest location that I could find, whether it's going to be in Westfield, London, or Meadow Hall, or the Bullring Shopping Centre. So, you know, where you know where do you want to put your product in the busiest location? All we're doing now is 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 doing that digitally. You know, getting your getting your offer, whether it's edible or physical, and putting it in the channel that people are using at the moment, and that is digital. And I think it's getting that understanding. But also, I think, um, you know, lots of um, senior people that I speak to, everyone's a bit concerned about holding their hand up and, and saying, look, I don't actually understand this. I don't know it. Everybody thinks everybody's... Um, uh, my, my colleague Polly talks about this a little bit. It's a bit like talking about sex. You think everyone's doing it more and everyone's a bit better at it than you are. But in actual fact, we're all pretty much the same. Uh, we should do it more. And we should do it better. So we're all basically turn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so if you took, you know, in, in that kind of analogy, um, you know, being able to stand back and go, um, do you understand this? No, I don't. Oh, I don't. Oh, I didn't. You know, I don't really understand it either. And then, and then start to get those baby steps, um, really, from from that perspective. And that goes from councils, that goes from asset managers, that goes for some very, very senior uh, retail execs as well. Um, you know, in in all the conversations I've had over the last three or four years I've never come across anybody with a job title of digital journey officer you know where do you where do you start that thought process sat on a Sunday night watching Top Gear wanting to buy a pair of boots um, you know normally you'll go to on a digital journey and then you'll end up where you want to uh, you know um, you know make your transaction uh, and but the understanding of how that journey touches people as they as they go along there I think is still very much misunderstood and um, take a step back and 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 relearn the basics i think really from from emily's perspective you know don't you know don't make it too complicated i think yeah i mean i mean lindsay from um, a hospitality restaurant perspective all very visual mediums i mean presumably you guys couldn't survive without a, a very strong online presence as well and uh, or, or do you or do some people not enjoy that side of the work or, or what, what's your experience i think um i think nigel's sort of nailed it to be perfectly honest in terms of there's it's been really good over the over down time for some things in terms of an actual fact getting hold of a phone and saying right guys this is what you need to do or go and look at this seminar or watch this youtube video or something and get to grips with this and i know a lot of people have taken the time to get used to social media a bit more but so scared of it so scared of it because the because you see things like um, Tesco or Primark or McDonald's or whatever, and it looks perfect. They've got the right wording, the right hashtags, they've got the right picture, the right lighting and all the rest of it. And I think the one thing that maybe has, has taught us over the past however many weeks we've all been watching the webinars, but is, is in actual fact, nobody cares. Get out there, take a photo. It doesn't matter if it's wonky, if you've got dodgy spelling or whatever, because it's your photo and in actual fact, in actual fact, the joy of being an independent, the reason we all do it is because, you know, it's our ideas, it's our inspiration, whether you're a chef, curator, or, you know, whatever you do within your establishment, you're doing it because you have a passion for it. And that's the thing that should come across, the absolute passion for whether you've got phenomenal views or amazing dishes it's it's just getting the passion across but so many people i mean literally i cannot tell you how many conversations i've had where i'm like doesn't matter just take the picture and yep. put it on a story but even last week you know one of our much beloved restaurants in cheltenham i sat and had a coffee with one of the um one of the owners and um she just she just well apart from literally which button do i press but she said but why do people want to see that and i said because to you and me, being in a kitchen means X, Y, and Z because we're used to it. I said, but sitting out the front, if you've never been in the kitchen, you've no idea how that dish is made. And I said, share the magic. I said, because it's the magic of the things that we can share so that people understand more about the story that will really bring a lot of more interaction to you across social media. Um, one of our um, cafes was, was doing... Um, meals at home and um, they did a video of them piping mashed potato on top of a fish pie nothing clever literally just piping mashed potato and they did it on a gif they had i think two and a half thousand views and they said why it's mashed potato going on top of the fish pie but there was something really quite hypnotic about watching this piping of the mashed potato 
and they said all the other videos they've done of all the other things nothing mashed potato piping nailed it <laughs> now Lindsay, <laughs> i think you're, you're, you you hit the nail on the head i think if you you know i i you know, we look at a lot of a lot of social, but I think you know, you know, for example, if you're a coffee shop and you're just constantly sending out a picture of a nicely curated flat work with a beautiful creamy head on it, um, seen it all before. What I want to see is the back of house and all this coffee coming in and the delivery, or yeah. you know, the you know the you know you know how's it? What what's the journey to, to get to that point? And I think you know the, the mashed potato piece it hits it on the head. Um, you, yeah. You're going to get loads more views on that than you would do if you've got a lovely curated, overly um, angled shot of the finished mashed potato, mashed potato landing on someone's um, table, I think. Absolutely, and I think the, the, this concept that it's about telling the story, like you're saying about the newspaper, it's about telling the story, and that's how people need to see it. Not this big, scary, needs to be perfect, needs to be at the right time of day, because obviously I think a lot, when social media came out, a lot of the information was, well, you need to do X, Y, and Z, and it seemed really complicated, where in actual fact, I think if somebody had said, take a picture, shove it up, don't worry about it. A yeah. lot more people would sink into it a lot faster than feeling like they've got to have this social media marketing no. idea. I think social allows you to be imperfect. I think that's absolutely spot on. It also is very forgiving and allows you to make a mistake. So if that fish pie got no views, well, if you don't do the fish pie, you try something different. Whereas, again, coming back to my old uh, career, you would have put a, an, an advert in a newspaper, for example, and that's your one shot for that week and it's expensive. Yeah. And if you don't get the wording right or you don't get the image ignored, you lose business. If you put 10 um, things on, on Instagram and only one takes up, it doesn't matter. That one's yeah. taken up. You, you can have your other nine and not worry about them. But uh, it is very unforgiving, so very, very forgiving rather. Um, so what about you then, Claire? What do you see as the relationship between online presence and physical presence and how they work together? I, uh, sorry, I'm going to use your example that you gave me, which made crystal clear sense to me, Nigel, years ago. And it was your story about a shoe shop that was in a major part of Cheltenham that had been doing what it always done for years and years and years. And I think that case study is worth sharing. So where Nigel's team went in and spoke to that shop owner and basically they were doing what they'd always done. They weren't aware of what the needs were in that area. So through maybe maybe could start listening in to the conversations and through that listening in and understanding what local people wanted, uh, realise that there was all the yummy mummies that wanted really designer-like trainers. So from that informed uh, messaging, they could make an informed decision and went away, had these amazing trainers um, created, but then use that digital platform to whack that out, saying, you know, come along on X day because we're launching our new range. And I don't know exact numbers, um, Nigel, but... What a brilliant example, because on the day of launching the trainers, suddenly they had a queue outside the front door of like 50 people. So that's where maybe can actually really help your business to think differently, you know, face up to that change. And everybody's resistant to change. But I really fear that in this day and age, and certainly working with the towns that I was working with, with um, the Association of Gloucestershire Business Group, there is that resistance. We've always done it this way. We're not going to change. We'll learn from maybe because what a great great case study that is if they hadn't embraced that change that business could have died you know that would have been it because literally literally their client base were getting to an age where they literally were dying off so unless you did embrace a new marketplace where would it be so i think education is really important this collaborative approach is really important it's about embracing change rather than fate uh, you know being frightened of it um, all of those mindsets, and this is, again, FSB, what you're doing is, is encouraging people to work together, think differently, and embrace change. Because I'm telling you now, in a lot of these Cotswold towns, they are still sitting behind the counter. They will still do what they've always done. And I know maybe, and Nigel, you've gone out and you've done some talks, but again, it's how do you get bums on seats? How do you get people to go and listen and learn? Because you can't keep on doing what you've always done, because you're always going to get what you've always got. So, yeah, I think, I think there's a, a real need and maybe again covid is that opportunity for people to start embracing change and think of doing things differently 100 percent. in fact it's, it's fascinating talking about all this about how we advertise in a sense because i'm going through um i finally got around to start watching mad men if anyone's ever seen that Great oh, my word it is wonderful and it just shows you about the, the the dawn of advertising the people that created it and oh it's just the most sumptuous 
Anyway, uh, Mad Men, a, re a big recommendation. So um, coming back to the high street, we, we um, obviously we advertise this event in advance and we have had a question sent through by um, Ang Harry, to forgive me if I said that wrong, Truman. And it says, do you think if the government proceeds with its plans to make it easier to convert retail to residential, that this will have a damaging effect on our high street? So we kind of hinted a little bit at this before, but what do people think? If, if it becomes easier to convert retail to residential, will that damage the high streets? What, what do you think? Start with you this time, Emily. What do you think? So, yeah, my with my different hat on, um, there are an awful lot of empty units that can be transformed into residential. And I know that a dormant building builds up so much more damage than a, an occupied one. So I, I, I embrace this as long as there are guidelines in and not, I'm not being strict and saying yes and no to these sort of things. I think having more people in the city centre will benefit the businesses that are there, hands down, and the community, as long as we've got enough doctors, schools, those services to do it, and a place to put your bins. That's always comes up when you think about accommodation in the city centre. How do I put my bins out? Build, buildings are in need of occupation, um, and if that, that's the government decision to allow this to happen, is affirmed and can do this, I think people will embrace that. I don't, I don't think, as long as businesses can still be at the bottom and then the accommodation be at the top for the city centre, I think that's a bonus. I mean, that's how it was in the medieval times, you know, people lived where they worked and, and embraced where they were. And I think that's what we need to bring back in again, is that people can live and work in the same place. There is obviously going to be the people thinking the redevelopers will bring in, push out businesses again, but I think then this this needs to have a balance of where we're going to. Um, I, th I think it will be good and it is a change, but it has to be done correctly. Otherwise we could, well, yeah, be regretting it. That's my opinion. And to jump in, sorry, I just- No, no, no uh, I was gonna come to you because I could see you were nodding. I was itching because it's on my list. I was like, oh, when can we talk about this? Um, there was an amazing woman that I work with um, in a little place called Holsworthy, which is North Devon. It's dying on its feet. It's really sad and they're hemorrhaging. Young families can't afford to live there. And even if you look at how you equate to what an affordable housing uh, house is, it's still too expensive because the salaries in these, you know, tiny little villages and what have you out in the sticks is just disproportionate to the cost of the properties. I mean, I think Chipping Camden, average house price is half a million. You know, how do these youngsters stay in those towns? They can't afford to live there. So what she did, which was inspiring, there was a spa shop in the main street in Holsworthy and above it was all this empty space. So she took it upon herself. She, she should be awarded something for doing this because she actually cut through all the red tape and basically they took the space they work with a local college. They used apprentices to come and learn their skills in a real world. They got people that had got um, mental health issues or whatever who'd lost their confidence to teach and work with the younger ones. They got the age gap thing taken on board, talking about communities, the young working with the old. They reconverted this space. I think they made three flats above this spa shop and it enabled um, three families with young children to actually stay in that town. So from a community and keeping that lifeblood and keeping the schools open and la 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 what a wonderful case study and how those families didn't have to use cars and pollute the environment they cycled they walked they they thought local they bought local and suddenly you get that wheel going round and round where um i think we can learn a lot from situations like that because it is it's a community within that town and without that community the town falls to bits Absolutely. I am see your passion on that one. Uh, Lindsay, you, you, you were nodding as, as well at that. Do you, do you, are you not worried that we, some of our lovely retail stores might end up as a, a, yet another house? No. Well, I think like Emily was saying, I think if you control it, it can only be a positive. Mm. I, If you look at Cheltenham as a whole, we've got Bishop's Cleeve, you've got um, Leckhampton, Bath Road. I mean, we're spread out in such a, a massive area that to have one or two more sort of flats in the city centre to me isn't an issue because I think we've got the the local clusters like Bath Road and, and you know so there's there's enough going on in everybody's individual part of Cheltenham that it still creates a, a fantastic environment for us all to to trade and live and work in and and to me that makes a lot more sense than some of these massive developments that are happening I mean my friend it's the other side of the country but my friend lives in this area they they built this fantastic housing development full of all this assisted houses and all the rest of it 
nobody has a garage or parking so all of these people are now you know mums with young children are feeling so alone because they can't get anywhere because all they can do is get on a bus the buses aren't really that regular and now in actual fact they've been doing studies on it because the mental health of people in that area is so low they feel so disconnected that they just feel really stuck and you think that doesn't make any sense at all. It's so much more better. Well, Claire's example is just perfect. I mean, isn't that just wonderful to be able to have nooks and crannies throughout the whole of town? And to me, that brings vibrancy. It brings blend. We're back to the word. But, you know, it blends everything. And I think Cheltenham would be phenomenal if we just had loads of people bustling around in all the different areas. I mean, what a what an environment to live in. It's you, you really will have a very mini London in the in the beautiful Cotswolds. Nigel, how does that sound to you? More residential will benefit town centres and high streets, you think? Uh, yeah, um, I, I, I think it's always more nuanced. Um, it's more grey rather than a black and white uh, interpretation of this. I think there's you know if you look at go a little bit further outside of Cheltenham, look at some of the lovely Cotswold towns, and there's concern that. You know that you know all that's going to happen is those little um, buildings are going to get converted to uh, uh, to residential, and and that's going to um, mean that those towns are going to collapse. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think there'll always there'll always be a little bit of an interpretation there. But going back to the bigger cities, um, you know, look at what Gloucester has delivered over the last couple of years and what it is going to deliver. That is absolutely going to be the powerhouse of its economic reinvigoration. Um, you know, and new um, you know new residential provides other things that you know you've got to have other services that need to come in on the back of it so it, it, it's a nice flywheel I think the challenge sometimes is where you've got towns which have got a little bit of this and a little bit of that and it's more challenging to try and sort of rather than just sort of piecemeal do a little bit of it sort of take right we're going to redevelop the whole of this sector and create a new quarter I'm a, I'm a big fan of quarters if you look at you know the big cities they've all they've all got little quarters they've all got areas and i think it's, it's going back to that basic interpretation of, of where is the best place for this residential reinvigoration and how is that going to ripple out to other parts of the town rather than going right we're going to stick a bunch of flats here they're not in keeping over there and this that and the other so it's it's getting the framework right is it going to be perfect no but i think it's it's probably more positive than negative i think mm. I just want to say that because of um, you're saying about quarters, we've got the Cathedral Quarter in Gloucester, which is part of the High Street High Street Heritage Action Zone, mm -hmm. which is part funded by Historic England. And it is actually looking at the historic buildings that we've got on Westgate Street and being able to convert the upper floors into livable flats. Mm -hmm. Some of the some of the buildings are in a dire strait and will need more uh, it's the more money put into it than it's worth so sadly we might have to lose a few but the, the, there is the potential and there is project going on at the moment converting two upper floors um above a shop into two flats ready to sell to people to live on the high street and i think people want to see it to see how it's done then they'll go oh actually we can do that i've got that let's change that round so fingers crossed that'll be a really good positive story again for Gloucester to see that happening and in listed buildings as well which we all know is quite painful no it's a great project that i think is very exciting so i hope that answers your question and i think i think we could sum it up by saying that cautious cautiously um optimistic on this front um and, and on a similar subject i i, I want to talk about debenhams and um debenhams is quite close to to my heart and I, i'll tell you why because the other side of that wall my next door neighbor um is now edna lee now edna um broke some kind of record i think in that she worked for debenhams for 64 years she started when she was she was 15 and she left in her final role when she was 79. It's incredibly important to her. It always has been. Remarkable lady. Some of the stories she comes up with, she was on Radio Gossip at the weekend talking about it. Um, includes the fact that, would you believe, at one point they had a live lion on the ground floor that kids would go and see as, a, as an attraction. Um, they've had uh, Santa's arrived by helicopter. Shankard, Santa's been drunk. Oh, the, the story she comes up with is lovely, but... She's, she's 88 now, but still very, very passionate about the Debenhams. Now, you would imagine that the closure of Debenhams has, has been heartbreaking for her, but she's quite excited about the fact the university are going to take that slot. You'd think she'd be, this is terrible, we need another store to come in. What's happening, for those that don't know, is that um, the university are going to build a, um, a new campus, actually, uh, on that in that site, 
which I thought the moment I heard it, yes, I thought this is fantastic. It's going to bring that area to life. There are really a lot of great work going on there anyway. But I think the stores around it, you're going to get more coffee shops for the students. You're going to get more fashion. You're probably going to get more entertainment venues. So um, is that not exactly what we're talking about here? Reinvigorating the high street. But on the surface, someone turns around to you and says, Debenhams is closing. It's been replaced by a non-retail. That's a failure, but it doesn't actually have to be. Emily, would you agree? Absolutely. I mean... I, I started my career off in the Debenhams Cafe, so I, I have my connections with Debenhams, and that Not was quite seventy nine years, sixty four no, years. No, no, I did it for for a summer term, and then I realised I don't think I'm any good at this, so I'll change. So, um, <laughs> I think with the the Debenhams store, it's the iconic building that people have more of a relationship with, and the history of that. And if that building had gone it just unoccupied for X amount of years it would be in such a terrible state and be an eyesore. I think the reassurance that it's going to be occupied by a, by a different use and seeing it in a different purpose has just brought uh, you know, the excitement back to the city. And people who have worked there are going, oh, the building's going to be saved. Yeah. I remember working in there and now it's going to be something different. So I, th I definitely think it's more of the building and where it is and knowing it's going to be reused has sort of had a bit of a relief for people who have previously worked there. I, re I really do. I think it's the iconic buildings just has a huge part on any place. I mean, there's some terrible Debenhams and around the city that around the country even that ha are not going to be repurposed. But with one in Canterbury, where I started off, they got three sites and one of them is going to be a, a five star hotel, which is perfect for Canterbury. There are, I think we can see the same with where Woolworths sort of demised and they've all gone on to be different types of but you can always pick out a Woolworths can't you on a high street you go oh look there's a Woolies I don't know it's just one of those things it's it's the journey of that that brand and the, the high streets. It's, it's interesting what you say there Emily about town centres um uh, speaking to some of, again some of the bigger landlords in London a lot of the the Debenhams um are, are probably going to go to the likes of Next who've made an active decision to you know to reposition themselves um, with bigger stores in city centres because they see that's the, you know, that's the model going forward. Um, you know, I agree with Gloucester. I think, um, you know, it's a fantastic looking building. If you look up, um, you know, it's, you know, it's a great way of, of saving and reinvigorating and repurposing and all those students milling around and um, generating a great atmosphere. So I think it's, I think it's great news personally. Uh, what, what about you, Claire? Because it won't just be Debenhams and it won't just be Gloucester big old buildings being converted to something different. Is this a loss to the high street or a potential gain? I think, again, it comes back to that wonderful word that uh, Emily used, which is blend. We've just got to have that blend. But I think where the challenge lies is this ownership, this community engagement, this pulling together to feel that you've got part of that and that you're not excluded from that conversation for want of another word. And I, having set up AGBG to try and create a central hub to enable those conversations to take place. The challenge there is that it can't be funded, so it's run by volunteers. So some of our towns had really amazing chairs that were doing great things, and I have to flag Chipping Camden as being a prime example. The guy, Michael Orchin, that I work with there, he was amazing, but he'd taken early retirement. He'd worked in the jewellery quarter in a very, very high position within the town. Um, so he retired at 50, came into Chipping Camden, and thank you, Michael, because instead of spending all his time on the golf course, he was actually committed to that sense of place for Chipping Camden. And they went the extra mile they, as, a, as a business group. They were engaging with the schools, and, and they were helping them with interview techniques. And re He really immersed himself into that place. And it is that sense of place. So if we can have those conversations and if we can be inclusive, I think it works. I, I just think sometimes people feel, well, nobody spoke to me about it. Or, you know, and then you have that divert, um, stupid situation where everybody's fighting against everybody else. And we can't have that. It's just ridiculous. It doesn't achieve anything. And actually talking about that. That's why I'm a number one fan behind what Steve's doing with Visit Gloucestershire. Thank goodness, because working with all those towns, it, they wouldn't work with each other. I worked on the South Coast Regional Growth Fund, working with 11 destination management organisations from the Isles of Scilly up to the Cotswolds. We were going out to Europe to promote the South West as a region, which everybody was going to benefit from. Would they work together? No, they wouldn't. So, you know, having Visit Gloucestershire as that um, collaborative opportunity, and let's look at turf, collaboration works. Let's look at bid, collaboration works. Maybe getting out there. We really, really, if there's one message that I could pump out today on this, 
this session would be collaboration and talking because we're never going to change the world and make it a better place unless we talk to each other. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. And, and actually, I would agree with you about Visit Gloucestershire. I think it's a great thing and it brings every, all of us here together. And, and one thing I'll say about Gloucestershire, you can probably tell by my dulcet tones, I'm, I'm not from Gloucestershire. I'm from um, Tamworth in Staffordshire. And Staffordshire is probably a similar county to Gloucestershire in terms of size and so forth. But I had absolutely no relation with that county. I was passionate about my town, but no relation to the county. In Gloucestershire, people genuinely talk about Gloucestershire. There's that friendly rivalry between Chel uh, Cheltenham and Gloucester, particularly. Um, sometimes not so friendly, but they still feel like they're on the same side. And I think there's a real potential to build on that. So, um, Lindsay, coming back to Debenhams, just I just I know because it was such a big thing that's happened. Um, I don't know what the equivalent of that would be in, say, the Cheltenham area, but to lose a very, very iconic retail space and see it replaced by something like a, a campus, would that be a a negative for a town or a positive? I think a total positive. I mean, you've only got to look at the promenade at the moment in Cheltenham. It's decimated. It's for, for whatever the politics or the landlords or whatever else is behind it, you walk down it now and it's just sort of boarded up places and it doesn't doesn't make anybody feel encouraged to, to, to walk down it or, or to visit it. Um, and I think to, to have the younger generation and we were talking about sort of back towards the beginning of the session in amongst everybody else is is fantastic because then it, it gives them on it's it's putting things in front of them if if, if we're going to start to see a lot more you know staring at phones and and instagram and social and all the rest of it then let's contrast it with a really vibrant town whereby in actual fact when you when you aren't here and you're actually looking up and around it's full of full capacity whether it's students whether it's retail food and beverage whatever it is it's a, it's about everybody working together and i think a really interesting thing i've seen of, uh, through covid is the is the number of independent people that have exploded into a pop up it feels like mm. etsy has kind of come alive <laughs> in in 3d but if you've got an idea of doing something, it feels more achievable now. And I don't know if that's because of social or because maybe rents have been ditched or whatever, but it just feels like there's a lot more opportunity. So if we've got, you know, and again, taking something like um, down in Stroud, the idea of taking a big area and putting loads of individual people in it just works because you've suddenly got all of this dynamism going on and everybody benefits. There's literally no negatives to this. <laughs> No, that's, that's absolutely right. The word collaboration, and I know that sort of particularly police, Claire, has come through nearly all our conversations. So we are drawn towards the end of our time. And, I, and thank you so much for those of you that are still still with us, either live or, or later. Um, but there's a couple of questions I would like just to, to finish on, perhaps if we can all think on. Um, what advice would you give to someone thinking of setting up a new town centre store or restaurant or, or hotel now? And we'll finish with... Well, actually, to all give you a vision of what you think the best high streets will look like 10 years from now. I know that's difficult, but what the heck. So what about the, um, what what advice, what one piece of advice, for, if, Lindsay, if somebody was thinking of setting up a, a new B&B, a new hotel, a new restaurant in the area that you know, what, the other kind, what one bit of advice would you give to them in this post-COVID world, dare we call it that? I think, think less about who you're competing against and think more about who you can collaborate with. I don't think anymore. I mean, when I was at, at hotel school, it was all about, you know, make sure you're near your competition. You want to know what's going on. Keep your eye on them and all the rest of it. I think that's gone. I really do. I think the one thing that Turf has proved is that your neighbours are also your friends as well as potentially your competitors. But if we all work together and we all support each other, your business can absolutely fly. And, you know, it's testament to that. We all support each other. The, the busiest social media posts are the one where we're actually talking about each other's restaurants or cafes or bars or whatever. So, so that real community feel is there. So don't think about them. Don't think about your competitors. Think about your community and how you're going to fit into that community. Brilliant. Can I jump in there? Sorry, yeah, Sam. I, I, I couldn't help myself. Absolutely right, Lindsay. And my 
top tip was going to say, when you set your business up, just consider becoming a social enterprise. Because I was on the board of Jamie Oliver's 15 down in Cornwall. And what a brilliant example of, for those of you who aren't familiar with social enterprises, and I do think that's the way we have to go, is that basically the restaurant was the business. So they ran a very successful business. They brought the money in, but they, they didn't all go off and have wonderful Caribbean holidays. They took that profit and put it into this hand, which was the foundation. And then the foundation reached out in some of the most deprived areas of Cornwall and took youngsters and that money enabled them to learn the skills to become chefs. And they pulled them out of the poverty trap. And every graduation, there was never a dry eye because it's such an amazing story. But they also had the loyalty of their, their customers because customers wanted to go have a wonderful dining experience, of course. But they also wanted to know that their money was going to go and do, do some good in that community. So my top tip is ever, anybody thinking about setting up a business, just look into social enterprise and think about being a social entrepreneur. Sorry, I have to jump in, Lindsay. No, but that's brilliant. Um, Emily, I'm, I'm a big fan of bids. I'm big as a Gloucester resident, very grateful for the work you do for Gloucester Bid. Um, so if someone finds out that you do your job, they're thinking about opening the town centre store, what advice would you give them? Honestly, I th I'd made a note straight away. It was like, speak to the businesses that are there already. You wouldn't get a truer word than well, speaking to the neighbours and just saying, how is it? How's it going? How have you gone through this? Um, very well, you know, speak to the, the local authority and the bid and I will give you an honest opinion. Um, but I think there's nothing better than than your neighbours or your potential neighbours and they're going to give you the truest, truest response, really. Um, yeah, and then collaborative, like, Claire's going on again that's that's been in my heart for the last I don't know 10 years or so being part of something together was so much more rewarding than trying to do it on your own and no one really hears you on your own um so being part of something together and I didn't know that about social enterprises Claire I think that's a fantastic story and being able to pay back into the community um the profits it's going to have a huge knock-on effect so I'll put that on the list as well it's, it's probably no coincidence that you've all ended up on this group because I like collaborative people as well. And that's exactly what you all are. Um, Nigel, what about you? Someone comes up to you and says, Nigel, you know the, you know the retail game. Give me one bit of advice about setting up my new shop. Um, it's a bit like building a shopping centre without any roads. So, uh, um, of course, with um, my, my corporate background, I'd say set yourself up digitally. Um, do what Lindsay said, which is collaborate. Uh, do what Claire says uh, in terms of scratching each other's backs and do what Emily says in terms of understand your, your audience and your market positioning. So I think it's all of those. It's, it's, you know, it's having all the tool sets that you need to make your business successful. And you know, is, is it purely um, digital to the nth degree? No, it isn't, but you've got to make sure you've got the sharpest tool set in that direction. Is, is your retail offer the, the right offer for the local market? Who are your, who are your shining stars? Who, who can help you on your journey? Who can you pull alongside? And, um, um, you know, I, th I think any, any business that's thinking about setting themselves up now, it's a great time to do that because I think there are opportunities out there. You know, rents are more affordable than they used to be. And people are supportive of the local high street. And I think we all want to get back to making the high streets the best they can. Um, it's going to take a bit of grit and determination. But, um, yeah, I think it's, um, it's good times potentially ahead, but a lot of hard work. Absolutely. And that leads on perfectly to our final impossible question. Um, Ten years from now, I don't think there are any lions at the bottom of Debenhams, but what would your high street look like? A successful, thriving high street, either in a village, a town, your city, whatever it is. Um, I'll start with you, Nigel. What will it, what will it look like? Um, I'm going to go a bit off-piste here. Um, I've only been to Glastonbury once, and it was a few years ago, um, but I don't think things have changed an awful lot. So you've got, you've got a, basically a pop-up town of 130,000 people, all keen to socialize and every year it it's different so you've got different operators coming in different uh, people understanding different you know a different experience and i think it's it's almost taking that that uh, enthusiasm of a of a of a turbocharged pop-up environment and pushing it onto the high street and just making it fresh continually refreshing the offer rather than having old staid traditional 1970s retailer because uh, everyone talks about the halcyon days of retail I don't, i'm not sure that the 1970s were were any more halcyon when they were talking about new build you know shopping centers popping up all over the place so i think um i think we've i think we've we've 
got a better understanding of what needs to be done. I think it's just the grit and determination and unfortunately the cost of achieving that. So um, I'd say it's, it's vibrancy and continuous regeneration um, is what I'd suggest needs to be done in 10 years time. Brilliant. Lindsay, in 10 years time when your empire of a uh, uh, thousand uh, prem businesses is you get a day off, you walk down Cheltenham High Street, what do you want to see? What do you want to feel? I quite like Nigel's idea, but actually I'm going there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think, yeah, I mean, it is it is that vibrancy of, of, of somewhere that you want to be. You know, when I think back over the years, it's sort of any town centre I've visited around the world. It's just where you feel like life is happening. And I think that comes from having a lot from from diversity. So whether, it, you know, you you can have um, a student campus in the middle of town mixed together with, you know, some lovely old classic buildings mixed together with a market with loads of different independents but then you've got the high street you know retail and and just an absolute mishmash of everything so that it just feels alive i mean i think anything that feels alive that you want to go to i mean let's face it borough market in london is popular for for that reason itself it feels very alive and if if we can make cheltenham feel alive or wherever wherever that you know that town is feel alive that i guess that glastonbury sort of inspiration is is that in itself isn't it so yeah yeah i totally agree i think that's why independence is so important because otherwise we have identical towns you'd mm -hmm. almost you know you'd almost know that the boots would be next to wh smith would be next to Dorothy Perkins, I'm about to go into all these shots that don't exist anymore, but you do know what I mean? Whereas the yeah. independents break that up considerably. And uh, I love that. I, think, I think everybody's mindset's actually changing towards that as well. The number of people now that get somewhere and go, right, where's the independent? Because they know where Starbucks is and they know where Costa is and they know where McDonald's is. But actually, hang on a minute, where's the independent? Um, yeah. Excellent. So what about you, Claire? What would you like to see 10 years from now when you decide I'm going to spend an afternoon on the high street? I'm all for Glastonbury. Thanks, Nigel. I'm holding on to that. Because <laughs> I actually thinking about that analogy, Glastonbury does have all ages. I think people think, oh, it's just for the young and trendy. But no, old people like I, you know, I go to, well, I have, can never get tickets, but I would go to Glastonbury. And I think having that, as we've said, diversity, having all ages, young families, all of that mix is, is, is something to think about. And I, yeah, I'm quite excited. I think it can be like that. And I also think each town has, through its independence, creates its own personality. And that's why I always cite Stroud as an interesting one, because Stroud is very authentic. It is, it does what it says on the tin. It's got that quirkiness. And I think that's where our high streets have really suffered. As you walk down any high street and it was just the same old, same old. So you hadn't got that individuality individuality that um difference so you know i think independence bring them on let's bring them on let's have more different age people living in the towns that diversity thing and make it that vibrant place to be so yeah let's do glastonbury have you said a consolation claire I, I went to glastonbury three years running uh, the first year was when i was 46 so one day when you're 46 you'll be allowed to go and and it is absolutely right it is like nowhere i've ever been before it's the only place i've ever been where nobody cared what age you were, what your income bracket was, where your home base was, you were just there to enjoy the communal experience. And um, I could wax lyrical about it for, for very long, but but not the toilets. Emily, um, what about you? 10 years from now, when you're still the Gloucester bid manager, um, if you still want to be, but I hope you are, what do you want Gloucester to be looking like? I think communal experience, I think that's it. All, all what everyone said is it does build into that. It's just feeling accepted of where you are. The one thing I'd love to bring in, probably that Glastonbury does as well, never been, but it's just bringing the sustainability, the green of the city back in again. There's this the phrase rewilding your city, living walls, being carbon neutral. We need to get to that place. We need to be able to say, I don't want to take my car. I'm going to walk into the city centre or get the bus or, or something like that. We just need to think about the future and what we're doing now and being able to incorporate the sustainability, recycling, regreening into that plan um just so that we'll, we'll enjoy it a bit more and it's not going to be washed out with concrete or reinforced concrete or even just scaffolding i'm just going to say yeah it's um it needs to be brought in i have got some lovely we'll thank you thank you for that and uh, as i am an old press hacker i've always been very good at deadlines so would you believe it's one minute to 12 which is amazing um so um can i on behalf of all of those of you who are watching uh thank our panel um i hope you've learned some stuff i hope you've got some thoughts to be thinking about 
many of you are probably like I'm now thinking about that line at the bottom of Debenhams, but um, that was then and that worked then. It's not going to work in the future, but hopefully some visions that we've got here. And uh, uh, so thank you, Claire. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, Louise, for setting this up and the Business Insights Group. And uh, enjoy the rest of the festival and the rest of you enjoy the rest of your day. So thank you.